Um, let's let you know what's happening across the back pages this morning. Owen, you're going to kick us off with the flavour of the Irish Independent. Yeah, let's have a look at the back page of the Irish Independent. It's a picture of uh, Joey Carberry. He gets his chance to shine. Uh, he's pictured there at Carton House yesterday after yesterday's team announcement. He starts his first test for Ireland on home soil against Fiji on Saturday. Shemit, I'd take a win of any kind against Fiji, writes Rory O'Connor, while the find Kernan predicts remarkable series turnaround. He says, I was never more positive in my life. Uh, regarding tomorrow's uh, second test uh, against Australia and Perth. Last time that he was really positive. Yeah, I, I guess so. Um, they're 10 points down and it is 8.45am Irish time that one kicks off and there's a Gatland exclusive coming there tomorrow. Uh, it's all rugby on the back page of the front page of the Irish Times sports section this morning. Opportunity knocks in lineup of the uh, untried and the forgotten rights. Jerry Thornley here. Uh, just two players retained from the win over South Africa last weekend. Fiji's unique culture of play brings danger and opportunity rights. Uh, Liam Toland always interesting there. And Murphy amazed how quickly things can change. Jordy, uh, Jordy Murphy was playing for the Babas uh, the last couple of weeks has been drafted in to that Irish team and a lot of focus on uh, Joey Carberry across the back pages this morning. It's a uh, head scratcher for me Owen I have to say. Uh, Joey Carberry an incredible, incredibly talented player clearly but his preferred, his preferred position to play as he stated over the last couple of weeks is at out half but it's clearly not the plan for him at any level. I mean at provincial level he's playing 15, he's not the backup option to Johnny Sexton at Leinster, Ross Byrne has been that and continues to be that. I mean I don't know that if there's a central conversation, conversation taking place here about where Joey Carberry is going to sit over the next number of years and people are deciding that actually the Johnny Sexton isn't going anywhere quickly so 15 is your place. But mm. then to be throwing him in at 10, like he's played, is it six minutes he played against South Africa last week and that's kind of it for the season? Yeah, uh, like I'm not sure is that actually the case because you've obviously had Rob Kearney being injured early in the season. So they see some sort of potential in Carberry at 15. They've had crucial Champions Cup ties that they needed to win. Like it's not like the club season so far has been something that they can just brush aside and get to the November International. They, they were games they needed to win in Europe. That so the long-term plan might be for 10 anyway. I, I think so, yeah. I think Ross Burns was the backup 10 because Carberry was utilised elsewhere. Like, I, it's not just Carberry himself who's said he wants to play at 10. There's a lot of people like Alan Quinlan who said that his future is at number 10. My question, though, is how is he going to get that vital test experience? Like, he'll get Fiji tomorrow, but how will he get the real pressure cooker of even a Champions Listen, Cup tie at 10? It doesn't matter what happens against Fiji tomorrow, really, right? From well, his point of view. Like, he goes what, out and an absolute stormer. It doesn't really make any difference. Johnny Sexton's going to be back in the next day. Like, actually, if you sit back, and as a Leinster supporter, it, t it troubles me, in a way, to say this, but if you sit back and look at the grand scheme of things and look at the state of the provinces and maybe another high-profile Irish province in the country that maybe doesn't have the quality 10 that maybe they need and the opportunity that ex exists there. Now, uh, in a million years, Joey Carberry isn't, I don't believe, going to make the move from Leinster to Munster. But there's an opportunity there waiting for him to get frontline rugby in a position that it seems, on the basis of his selection against Fiji, the RFU actually believe that maybe that is partly where his long-term future lies. And who will be his half-back partner at Munster? Uh, Joey gets a nod as well, is the back page of the Irish Daily Mail still in the rugby. Uh, Schmidt hands number 10 shirt to Carberry for Aviva Test against Fiji. You've also got a picture there of O'Shea in the water in Perth. Uh, O'Shea is making waves in Australia, reads the headline. Uh, Splash Landing is the photo caption. Aidan O'Shea takes a dip in Perth ahead of Ireland's second international rules test against Australia tomorrow. I think it's your favourite genre, Adrian. Uh, lads in GA shorts at the beach. It just uh, sums up the international rules. It's the one thing that I never really fully understand, and it's a theme on the uh, front page of the Examiner uh, this morning as well. Thrill of a lifetime, Ireland boss Kernan. Never more positive, as Owen said, about rules experience. Uh, Ronan Agara as well inside there. There's uh, some good stuff for him, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on. But the thing I don't ever understand about this particular genre, as you uh, rightly call it, is that why a sports team, sports teams from the Northern Hemisphere who go to Australia or that part of the world, um, they don't ever really seem to bring swimming shorts. Like, whether it's the Lions mm. jumping into their Lions shorts, no, or it's GA players jumping into the GA shorts, lads, like, throw in the old speedos or whatever you're having yourself. No, I think it's pretty clear Ed Noche is wearing swimming shorts here. So, Ed, Noche sorry to burst is your the one, Ed Noche is the one exception, but, like, we've got a selection of players here, Shane Walsh and others, on the front page, and they are clearly in the O'Neills here, Owen, I'll point out. Mm.
Maybe, maybe this he's the one of... exception. He's, he's well planned. Yeah, absolutely. He is, of course, on the back of the Times. Um, Life's a beach for O'Shea, reads the caption. Uh, Ireland captain Aidan O'Shea prepare for tomorrow's decisive international test while getting in the water. Uh, the big story, though, on the back of the Times, Ireland edition, is three jump jockeys fail drugs tests. Now, these are unnamed jockeys. Uh, two of them are amateurs. One of them uh, is apparently, according to Johnny Ward's exclusive here, has won a high-profile race in Ireland. They could all be set for a two-year ban. The drugs are not performance-enhancing, so it seems they're recreational, and there's no date set yet for the hearing. Just in terms of like what clues you might get here, Johnny Ward's information that he points out in um, the piece, he, he kind of talks about this idea that if you're not one of the top jockeys, you're living off scraps that the top jockeys leave behind, and potentially that could leave you into kind of use of recreational drugs. So that kind of suggests the profile of the jockeys we're talking about here. But there's no names mentioned. The turf club are to press for lengthy suspensions, he says. So it's going to be very interesting to see if these names do come out and uh, if the two, the full two-year ban will actually be followed through with. It was um, Kieran Fallon was obviously in off, with Off the Ball a couple of weeks ago and spoke in uh, at length and both in studio and in his book about his issues with cocaine. And I mean, you only have to read Johnny Ward's piece in the Times this morning to get a sense of the problem that that particular drug has within or the that the racing industry jockeys particularly have with that drug it's yeah. pretty phenomenal i mean it's in you know as you say it's there as um recreational use but um, I mean it does seem to be pretty um, it's an issue in racing yeah Frankie Dottori and Shane Kelly mentioned as well there in terms of uh, cocaine use it, it, it just seems to be around in the in the sport quite a bit but it, it, like sometimes these names don't come out either so it'll be I, I'm sure it will over the next couple of days yeah. though back page of the uh, Irish Daily Star this morning uh, reunited Jose lines up Louise swoop is the uh, scoop here in the back from David Woods it's an exclusive it says here uh, David Louise could be set for a reunion with Jose Mourinho, the 30-year-old obviously has fallen out with his Chelsea manager, Antonio Conte. Um, I'm not sure how United fans feel about this, but I'm definitely interested to hear from you this morning. If you've uh, got a take on this, do let us know. I mean, it does feel to be a bit of a head-scratcher to me, I have to say, David Luiz, who, if Jose Mourinho maybe can get last season's form out of David Luiz, and um, I mean, that's an attractive prospect, but by and large, he's been a player that has been... An easy one, I guess, to poke fun at um, at the various clubs that he's been at. He was uh, running out of time with, time with Chelsea. Um, and they're also talking about, like, the other thing is here, 38 million quid on David Luiz. I mean, that might be money they could spend elsewhere. Um, no, it's not. David Luiz is worth every penny of 38 million. Go on. I, I, he's, an outstanding, he's an outstanding player. He is... I, I, Based on last season, really? Not really, to be honest. I mean, uh, like... He was fl Chelsea would have hung on to him. They wouldn't let him go to PSG previously if... He's this was a guy who was, uh, you know, who was going to be a, a fulcrum of their defence. He's an incredibly easy target because he's not Gary Cahill, because he's not this perceived teak tough uh, Premier League defender who will clatter a striker out of it if he dares to run rings around him. He's a ball playing defender, and he showed what is possible in a football team if you place two Gary Cahills or a Gary Cahill one side, Cesar Azpilicueta the other side of him. What is possible with a back three when you have a man who is good at playing football, as David Luiz is, yeah. in the middle of your back three? I, I just find this. A football, does a football playing um, central defender work for Jose Mourinho? How does he fit into the United system? He's 30, they're going to pay 38 million quid for him. He, he hasn't, doesn't fit he in hasn't got a litany of. He hasn't, his, his, his entire career has not been populated by um, um, season, uh, by award winning, personal award winning see, uh, performances from David Luiz. That hasn't been the sort, that hasn't been his track record. Like, um, I don't know, I think 38 million is too much. I think that Chelsea have got rid of him once, they're about to get rid of him again. Maybe Mourinho is this guy that we, he works his magic on him and he brings last season David Luiz out of him and he gets four seasons out of him at that level. But um, 38 million would mean he's cheaper than Gilfie Sigurdsson. Yeah. 38 million is, well, a good, is a good, reasonable is, price to pay for Gilfie, David Luiz. Gilfie Sigurdsson, the benchmark is... The, the question, though, is does he fit in with Jose? And that, that's a different uh, conversation altogether, because yeah. I don't think he's great in the back four, but like, do you play him beside Nemanja Matic mm. the, in, as two holding midfielders? Yeah, that could be a very changes, exciting yeah, proposition. Yeah. Uh, Marino staying put, by the way, is the other story from Jer Jeremy Cross in the Irish Daily Star this morning, that uh, there had been links between Jose himself, obviously, and PSG, but according to Jeremy Cross this morning, he is staying. 
A uh, quick look at the back of the Irish Sun. It says fear and loathing in North London. Wenger says Spurs scared uh, until trophy glory. Of course, he's making the point that uh, Spurs have won nothing, he says, uh, since Pochettino has taken care of the club. Uh, Arsenal have won two trophies in that time, although St. Tottenham's Day didn't occur this year. We'll actually be chatting about that with Ray Parler in just a moment. And on the back of the mirror, it says yours for £70 million. Another big transfer story today regarding Virgil van Dijk. Uh, Saints admit van Dijk could be sold in January on the cops Klopp return from his sickbed. Uh, the Herald Sport uh, pullout, no regrets, but glad to be back. Danny Sutcliffe is back in the Dublin Hurling Fold. He uh, left to go travelling to New York um, a couple of years ago. Danny Sutcliffe's only 25 was the one thing that um, I was <laughs> kind of shocked to read this morning, but uh, work commitments and his visa running out essentially in the US means that he's back here. Pat Gilroy's been on the phone to him. He's going to back, get back in with the Dublin Hurlers. Uh, so that's uh, Conor McKeown writing there in the Hurl, and you can read Brent Pope, John Giles, uh, and more inside. Yeah, that's going to be a very interesting proposition next year to Dublin Hurlers. Definitely the one to watch when it gets to these big 2018 year previews. Yeah. No pressure or anything? No pressure, and they've obviously confirmed a pretty interesting backroom uh, team as well during the week. Um, on the front page of the Telegraph pullout this morning, it's Bully Boys. Check it accuses England of targeting his halfbacks with late tackles. And, I mean, we can see all that happening there. But it is fairly typical Michael Chaka stuff in the week of a game, saying to the referee, essentially, by the way, make sure these guys, they're, they're not playing within the rules, ref, just so you know it, and mm. get that message out nice and early. Absolutely. We'll have a look uh, a bit more into the English front pages, or the sports sections, anyway, later on. Some very interesting stuff inside of the Telegraph, actually, which we'll put to Kevin Kilban later on, when he's previewing the North London Derby, and, indeed, Manchester City-Leicester. Good, very, very good inside the John Stones there. Yeah.